This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. Welcome back to The Forging Table. The mission of Undaunted Life is equipping men to push back darkness with content that's... <laughs> that wasn't a part of it. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I messed up. You know what? There's been several times where we are all joking right before I did hit my intro, and I've thought about putting it in there, but anyway... <laughs> It would affect the final thing, so everybody shut up so I can talk out loud. Here we go. Welcome back to The Forging Table. The mission of Undaunted Life is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. At The Forging Table, you'll see a group of regular guys forging spiritual resilience by digging into God's Word, and we're welcoming all of you to come along on that journey with us. That's Matt. That's Zach. That's Eric. Hey, I did y'all out of order this time. Got to keep you on your toes. Here we go, guys. So we ended up Matthew 9, where Jesus is basically talking about how the laborers are few, and then we get into Matthew 10, and we're right on top of really learning learning who are going to be the people in Jesus's inner circle, right? So he's got his disciples and he's calling his 12 apostles here. So Matt, if you would, let's read Matthew 10 verses one through four, please. Sure. And he called to him, his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the 12 apostles are these first Simon, who is called Peter and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. You pronounce them all correctly. No, sorry, Joby's here, but there's a few things here to point out before we all pick our favorite disciple. So get ready. So apparently there's a difference between, I never knew what the difference was between disciple and apostle, right? I just thought the apostles were the super cool ones and the disciples were just everybody else. But apparently disciple means students and apostles means those that were sent on a mission. And so these specifically, it's more apt to call the 12 apostles than disciples, even though it's interchangeable though those two titles i saw you uh, nod your head zach when i was talking about that did you see something about the difference between disciples and apostles yeah, it struck me too i just i read this uh it says a person had to meet certain qualifications to be an apostle of jesus christ he must have seen the risen christ and fellowshiped with him he had to be chosen by the lord the apostles laid the foundation of the church and then passed from the scene While all believers are sent forth to represent the king, no believer today can honestly claim to be an apostle, for none of us have seen the risen Christ. Was was Paul apostle? He Paul the apostle? Yeah, he was, but he was called directly by Jesus, and he speaks to that in some of his letters, that he was called by Jesus, so he was an apostle. I think that that is a great point that you made, because... There is a, a subsection of, of churches who believe that they are apostles. And there's this, the NAR, the new, the new apostle, can't remember what the R stands for, but uh, they, they believe that they are in the line mm. of the apostles and they get into some pretty interesting things. But yeah, I think that's a good point. It like, seems similar to when people say they're in the line of Peter and they're the Pope. And, you know, I've talked with my Hypoth- Catholic hypothetically. friends. Hypothetically. Yeah, it's like, so none of the popes have been accidents. None of them. Like, they've all been exactly the ones that were supposed to be chosen. Give me a break. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Yeah, what is it? Uh, so Peter was the first pope, right? According to them. And he was married, wasn't he not? He was. Yeah, it's kind of Believe me, I brought that up. Interesting. It's like, wait it? a minute, you jerks. It's like, if Peter can have a wife, what's wrong with you guys? What makes some, y'all yeah, special? There's some, there's some questions for sure, but. This isn't the anti-Catholic podcast. This is the anti-Andy Stanley podcast, okay? so, um, But I did want to point one thing out. I forgot who, who wrote this down, and so I want to give them credit, but I forgot to write it down. This never occurred to me. So Simon the Zealot, he would have been for the complete overthrow of Rome. Like, he would have trained for overthrowing, overthrowing Rome. And then you have Matthew, who worked for Rome. And here they are on this same team. I can't think of, like... This would have been like Larry Bird, Magic Johnson joining the Milwaukee Bucks or something like that, like back in the day for all you old school basketball fans. This would have been just so completely unheard of that these two men would be on the same team, but it's like Jesus is going to call who he calls. So does anyone have a favorite? Does anyone have like a a favorite of these 12? And don't be one of those weirdos like, oh, Bartholomew is my favorite. No one even knows what he did. (laughs) He's not even a real person. He was just named here, and then we get nothing else about Bartholomew. So do we have favorites? Fellas. Nobody wants to be the first one to say they got a favorite? Yeah, James and Peter, probably for me. James James very practical. Peter was just, he was entertaining because he just said whatever was on his mind and oftentimes got himself in trouble, but but God transformed him. 
into you know, rock for the church. So I guess one more thing just to add this. I know you hear the questions today, like how come nobody's performing miracles like this? And why don't we see what we saw back then? I guess the other thing this would just point out is that the apostles were given special power and authority from Christ to perform these miracles at the time. Uh, and then like he mentions later that then they passed from the scene and then you have disciples effectively from that point forward. Yeah. And isn't it uh, interesting that Judas would have been one that could have done miracles. Yep. Right. And, and like we did, he was, he, was like given, we did. he was given authority right there. Yeah. Well, fellas, do y'all have favorites? Matthew, I guess would be the, the clear one for me. Cause that's my name. Yeah. But, that helps. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I, I like Peter though. To, to Eric's point, like I like Peter cause he's just, he's so real. Yeah. Like you could, you could right. see a lot of people can see themselves in Peter. If you can't see yourselves in yourself in Peter, like, man, what are you doing? Right. Like he's, he's very, like, very, very real, relatable. Zach? I don't know. I, I think just because of what I've been consuming recently, James really stands out for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, but James, son of Zebedee, or James, son of Alpheus? <laughs> Zebedee? Okay. <laughs> Pretty sure that's one you were talking about. I would say I'll, I'll just kind of round out like uh, Peter. Thanks. Peter would be the one for me as well because, like, when, when people say, like, hey, if you know, who in the Bible would you want to like sit down and, you know, talk to if you could like understand the language and it can't be Jesus. I always say Peter, but then I'm like, that would be a disastrous meeting because we're so much alike. We would hate each other. Like, yeah, we would just like basically fight the entire time. So that would not be a birds of a feather type of situation. So, um, I'm worried since I'm going out of order, Zach, uh, how about you read verses five through 15? Actually, wait, pause. I forgot to talk about the stack of books that are here on the table today. So guys, if you were, haven't been listening the last several weeks, we keep getting asked by people, hey, I want to start my own forging table, but I don't exactly know what to do. And I typically just say, hey, open up the Bible and start start there. But I decided to partner with Crossway. They are a fantastic publisher, and this is not a commercial. This is not something we're getting paid to talk about. We just wanted to put something together with you guys or for you guys to use if you're starting a forging table. And so I you know, got the guys here to kind of think through, and we worked with Crossway, and we came up with five books that make up the forging table starter set. So these five books, if you buy them off the Crossway website, website. And I'll tell you how to do that here in a second. You can get all five of those books and then get half off of the entire set. You literally cannot get that set for that price anywhere else on the internet. So the set includes the brand new ESV men's study Bible. So that is a men's focused Bible, but it does have a lot of the notes from the ESV study Bible. That's their most uh, purchased study Bible that they've sold. Also, we have the Book of Romans Scripture Journal Study Edition. So it's just like these journals. I just got a DM, you know, uh, before this one started where someone's like, thank you so much for mentioning the the ESV journals through Crossway because I use them in my church now. It's those journals, but it has the ESV Study Bible uh, references on the bottom of the pages. So it's absolutely fantastic. Then we have a uh, New Morning Mercies by Paul David Tripp. That is a devotional. So that's for guys that don't really know, hey, what devotional should I do? That's a great one. Doug O'Donnell has a book in there called The Beauty and Power of Biblical Exposition. That'll give you kind of an intellectual dive into the different types of writings that are in the Bible, so it'll kind of help you as you're reading. And then we round it out with Family Shepherds by Vodi Bauckham. So that is a tremendous book for men that are wanting to be a shepherd for their family, to catechize their kids, to perform headship over their household. It kind of gives you that. So all five of those together make up the Forging Table Starter Set. It's just a three-step process. It's here in the show notes. You need to go to crossway.org and you set up a brand new free Crossway Plus account. Step two, you need to put all these books in your cart. And then at checkout, this is the final step. You need to put in this promo code BSSP50 to get 50% off of that. That is Bravo Sierra Sierra Papa 50. And you'll get 50% off that set, guys. If you're driving or working out right now, don't worry. All that will be in the show notes. You should definitely check that out. Now, Zach, if you wouldn't mind reading verses five through 15, please. These 12 Jesus sent out instructing them. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Acquire no gold or silver or copper for your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for the laborer deserves his food. In whatever town or village you enter, find out who is worthy in it, and stay there until you depart. As you enter the house, greet greet it. And if the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, 
let your peace return to you. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. We're going to get back to that, but I do want to go back to something that you talked about earlier in this section, which where he's talking about, you know, give without pay, don't acquire any gold or silver, like, you know, don't take extra stuff. This is a big time test Mm -hmm. because these are people that knew how to be nomadic. They knew how to travel and they knew what they needed in order to travel. So imagine you're going on a business trip and someone's like, Hey, don't, don't bring any extras. Like don't, don't take anything with you. Just depend and rely on the people once you get there. But it's not just, hey, rely on the people once you get there. It's like, hey, I got you, okay? You're doing my work. I've given you these, these powers. I've given you this authority. Like, just trust me. And so it doesn't say that they didn't do that. So I would assume that if they didn't do that and there was some sort of a parable or lesson that that would have, that would have happened here. But I think that that's an interesting thing to think about. Like, hey, man, go on ministry. Don't worry about, you know, storing up stuff for yourself. You're out here to do my work. Yeah, I think there was an instance either, I would assume before this, where they did do that. Um, and, and so this was kind of the flip of that, of, of Jesus saying, you need to rely on me, rely on God more um, in this situation. I think it's uh, also a call to us and how we should be in fellowship together. And, you know, there's a model for the, the church there, the early church. They, they did life together. And, you know, you, you helped those who needed help. You gave to those who, who needed. And so there, there, there was this strong sense of community, which in some ways I think we've kind of lost sight of um, in our modern world. I mean, everybody, it, it, certainly in our circles, can provide for themselves. But there's this real sense of, man, that guy needs something. I'm just going to give it to him. I'm going to give yeah. it to him freely. Yeah, <clears throat> this is like the uh, the first nonprofit ministry, right? Yep. <laughs> I remember when we were in, um, I was in a, on a mission trip in Eastern Europe when I was in college, and our last stop was in the Ukraine, and we went and ministered to folks in the streets, in the town square, and then also in hospitals. And I remember having a really interesting experience in the hospital. I I had been praying that. I would see some fruit from um, being on that mission trip and talking to folks and whatnot. It was kind of probably a little bit selfish, but nonetheless, I just was like, I'd love to see someone like respond to the gospel. And we were in a hospital room where there were two gentlemen, both of them were terminally ill. I don't know what they had, but apparently they, the people thought we were okay being in the same room as them. So we were in there ministering to them. And I went and talk, spoke with a gentleman who was looking out the window, did not want to look at us. And I just talked to him about Jesus and he um, listened, <clears throat> had a couple of questions, but ultimately kind of was like, eh, I'm, I'm not really into this kind of thing. Well, at that same moment on the other side of the room behind a curtain, a gentleman started calling out and um, the interpreter said, hey, this gentleman wants to talk to you. And so I went over and spoke with him and talked, talked to him, told him about Jesus and the gospel and shared it with him. And he accepted Christ right then and there. Uh, which was amazing, um, and then wanted to pay me for that time that we had had. And I, and I remember being taken back, but it was just like, no, 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 no. This is not how that works. This is a free gift. Um, but that, I mean, that that's kind of the same issue. It, it, you know, they're not going in there to try to make money spreading the good news um, of, of the gospel to people. Um, though people see it. Certainly, that guy did in that moment as something yeah, extremely you, valuable. You were, you were paid for your work. You, your labor was worth something. So, to get your day's wage was, I mean, you worked for that and you got that. And to tell them to well, don't take that now, I probably kind of puzzling. But I like I work and I get paid. But then, too, to me, I go. I kind of think of the wages of sin is death, and. Jesus says, you received without pay. Well, you, I mean, you didn't pay for my healing you, but you're also not getting what you actually deserve because rightfully your wage should be death. And I I have brought you the ultimate salvation. So therefore, as I've done for you, go do likewise for other people. That's kind of, I know I'm I'm reading in there too, but like that, that, 
that, that is what comes to mind there. Well, the other thing is I've, I'm pretty sure I've seen this scripture used against people that do ministry to be like, yeah, you're not supposed to be paid like to do this. And that's, that's come up for us before because I charge when I go and speak places, you know, we charge to have people advertise on our show or something like that, unless we've worked out some sort of other deal and people get kind of, you know, they get their hackles up on that. And it's just like, do you get paid for your time, talent and money? Do you trade or do you trade your time and talent for money? Is that something that you do? And it's like, why are you getting on pastors? So like when pastors have like business outside of what they do inside the ministry, whether it's selling books or speaking and stuff like that, it's like, what's the big deal? It's like, yeah, if they create an idol, it's the same as if you were to create an idol out of your side hustle or something like that. So we've seen that used a different way. <clears throat> I did want to talk about verses 14 and 15. Um, you know, this is where, you know, if these these towns don't receive you or listen to your words, you know, shake off the dust from your feet. That was commonly done by Jews when they would leave Gentile territory, just kind of like, ah, you know, almost like a, hey, we're just going to shake the dust off and like, you know, show our disgust for this. But truly I say to you, it will be more bearable on that day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. And it's just like, whoa, yeah. whoa. <laughs> like if you're reading this too fast, it's like, wait a minute. That is a brutal promise. Jesus said that? <laughs> yeah, and here's the thing. So, you know, uh, unlike some prominent pastors that think that the Bible only whispers on things like sexual immorality, I'm pretty sure it was loud when Sodom and Gomorrah was reduced to rubble. So, you know, shout out to J.D. Greer. You might want to read that that section of your Bible again. <laughs> but that's the thing that's very interesting about this is like, I guess we don't, we don't, we don't compare. If you were to compare what the people in Sodom and Gomorrah would do, were doing before they were destroyed and you look at like, oh yeah, these people just like reject you from their town. It doesn't seem right that that town would receive a worse sentence than Sodom and Gomorrah. But Jesus is like, no, if they reject you, like we're not going to forget, we're going to reduce that place to rubble and it's going to be worse than when we wiped two cities off the face of the planet. Do you think, do you think there are different degrees of torment in hell? Um, based on your rejection on earth. So what's interesting about that is if you read Dante's Inferno, that's exactly what you see. This is a fiction book, but they talk about the different levels of hell. And if you've seen any pictures depicting kind of the different levels of hell, and I'm pretty sure in the, the, the final level of hell, I'm trying to remember because it's been a long time since I read it, but like Judas is in one of the devil's hands or one of Satan's hands. And, and is it Hitler in the other? No, in Dante's it's, it's the Pope. Oh, is it the Pope? It's, it's the Pope. Yikes. It's the current Pope. It's his, okay. cur it's his current Pope at the time. Uh, Francis, that makes sense. But it's just like, you know, those are the last two people. They are in the the worst part of the torment. I don't know if we get that from Scripture, though. Yeah. Like, I don't know if we get, like, levels of, of hell I think or there's something some, like that. I think there's probably some apocryphal writings he's taken that from, but I, I would agree. I don't think we get that from Scripture either, but that's an interesting concept to think about. Well, yeah, I'm just I'm saying it's like— out. Yeah, well, of course not. I mean, Sodom and Gomorrah gets rained hell, hellfire and brimstone. I mean, it's kind of over. Like, how can it be worse than that unless it's happening afterwards for eternity? I don't know. It's just a thought. I'm it's like there, there are degrees of rewards. Right. So logically, if it's balanced, maybe there's degrees of hellish rewards or punishments. Um, I, you know, it seems also, I guess that they say it was made for, for demons and everything as far as, you know, how they're sent there and, and all that. Um, I, I don't know. I think I personally think that probably would be my best guess, but they say it's the absence of God. So that's the absence of light and love and all those things. It doesn't say that there's degrees of absence of God. So maybe and not. How could it be like bad, bad if it's already bad? Right. Oh. Yeah. Well, it, it, the same thing true. I wonder if that's a human thing that we're putting onto the Bible right. being like, I really hope Hitler's just getting, you know, raped with a lava dick forever or something like, sorry, Matt, I'm sorry. Was wow. that too bad? Wow. Like, <laughs> well, one, that's, that's <laughs> semantically <laughs> inaccurate because it's a, it's a pineapple oh. in the movie that you're referring <laughs> oh, to. But. Sorry. Well, you know, I'm just saying like, we want things to be way worse than just for, <laughs> what did you, you know, call it? Bolivating or something? <laughs> Bolivating. <laughs> Bolivating. Bolivating is what they do. What is it? Where's Bolivia? South America, Central America. <laughs> oh. Sorry. You know, Hey, this is a man's show. I'm sorry. Sometimes we get out over our skis, but yeah, that, that's an interesting thought experiment. Like, are we putting our human expectations because we want Pol Pot to suffer. We want Mao to suffer. Like we want these people to suffer. We want the person that murdered our family member. We want them to suffer. But then there are people that lived quote unquote good lives that never hurt a fly, never took advantage of anybody. They're in hell just the same. Are they in the same version of it? I mean, wailing and gnashing of teeth 
and everything else in terms of how hell is I mean, described in the Jesus Bible. Jesus goes as far as to say there are people who prophesy in his name who are there. Yeah. So they don't seem to be having a good time. Probably not. Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's move along uh, because this next next section I think is really really important, and I'll, I'll set it up this way, Matt. And then if you wouldn't mind getting ready to read sixteen through twenty five, I think that there are a lot of ministries today, a lot of churches that have set Christians up wrongly. People who are either coming to faith for the first time or people who are continuing in their faith to have the wrong expectation about what life is going to be like for them. I've had friends who have lost jobs and all of a sudden they're they're not sure if God exists anymore as they're sitting in a home with air conditioning in a free country with Wi-Fi and a Netflix account and all these other things and they're wondering if this God will will ever exist and you know pop up so that they can have provision. So Matt, if you would read 16 through 25. Sure. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So we be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next, for truly I say to you, you will not have gone through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those of his household? So as you read that section, that gives you an accurate representation of what we are to expect to potentially happen to us for the sake of us having faith in Christ and living outwardly as a Christian. Um, One quick thing before I forget verse 20, for it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Um, The most recent time where I felt like that happened was whenever I spoke at Lewisburg prison, you know, I did everything I needed to do to prepare, you know, God can move mountains, but bring a shovel. I definitely brought a shovel or two, but then once I got out there, it's like, all right, man, you know, Holy spirit, let's get that. Let's get it. Like, I'm I'm just going to open my mouth and we're just going to figure it out. Same thing when you pray for people, but guys, just talk to me a little bit about how people have gotten this idea. And I, I wonder, there's a lot of reasons, but where, where did modern Christians get this idea? that when you become a Christian or when you continue being a Christian, that things are just supposed to work out and it's all just supposed to be peaches and cream. I just, I just don't get where we get the idea. I think, well, one, this is a promise. People like to talk about promises of God. God is, Jesus is promising some persecution here and we don't want that promise. Um, But I think here in the West, I think you can attribute it to the quote, um, tough times create tough men, tough men create good times, good times create weak men weak men create tough times. And because like the Judeo-Christian ethic has been at the center of our nation, um, that has, that is woven into the fabric. And I think that we here specifically in America have woven together the idea of prosperity and faith. And because a faith centered life and Deuteronomy and Exodus and, and the, the moral laws that govern the universe are at the core of our constitution and some of our founding documents that are all, all men are created equal, that that has kind of turned into this, well, if I'm a Christian, I should be good. I should be, I should be good because I'm adhering to the culture and there's some success that comes with that. I, I'm just, just a take, um, I guess. Yeah, sense. It's very easy to become passive um, in your faith. Uh, when you feel like, especially you know, with us li- living in the Bible belt, mm. it's like, oh yeah, everybody around here is a Christian, you know, so I don't have to work very hard, you know, and I don't expect a whole lot of pushback. Um, but we can see that things are changing and um, some of us, not many of us are being caught off guard in that respect. So yeah, I just think we've become very content. And um, I probably said it before, but 
you know, the human heart and we, we all need to go through little miniature revolutions um, from time to time to reassess where we are personally and in our faith and whether we are um, we're growing towards Christ and, and um, whether we're living out our purpose um, as called. So I'd say I almost had an opposite perspective. Um, you know, like my grandmother and grandparents would go, I would go to church with them growing up and, and still to this day, um, some of the biggest influences in my, in my life from a Christian perspective. Also, they sacrificed themselves uh, for people all, all around and, and have my whole life. And so a couple of things I remember before I decided to give my life to Christ that I was thinking was, A, for a long time I was running because I knew that I would have to change elements of my lifestyle f- to be an actual Christian, whatever that meant to me at the time, which was very scary. The second thing I thought about all the time was sanctification, this, this perception of what that meant. And the perception of some of the Christians that I knew always seemed to be going through some kind of trial. And I'm like, why do I want to go through that? You know, why, why is that? You know, I mean, so becoming a Christian means that I have to change my behaviors and I've got to be going through all these trials. That was kind of a perception that I had. It was not um, everything's going to be hunky-dory and prosperity mm. gospel or anything even like that. Maybe that's because I was processing it differently. But then I would just say to anybody that does have that thought, uh, my perspective now is that those things are true, but I think it equips you to go through the challenges that you're going to have to go through inevitably. Mm in a certain level. And then I do think that, that God will put you to the test. Um, I mean, it says that it says that much in the word. So you have to expect that, but he's going to be coming along with you. When I think people don't, why would Jesus describe serpents and doves if we only needed to be innocent doves? Yeah. Right. Because the serpent is shrewd and cunning and smart and, you know, judging, judging. Yeah. Discerning in, in all those different ways. So why would he say that you need to be both? And so, because you don't need to be a serpent and need to be cunning and thinking about in all these ways if things are just going to work out for you. Like if Jesus is your get out of everything, difficult card, right? Like that he's your provision card, no matter what, you can always just swipe it and have whatever you need. You wouldn't need both of those types of things. And it's, that's one of the many dichotomies presented in the Bible. You know, Jesus is lion and lamb. He's grace and truth. He's asking us to be serpent and dove. And again, serpent that, that connects to the garden. Like there's, there's a lot of things there when it comes to that particular animal. Don't know why Jesus um, decided to use that as his example, but hey, I'll ask him someday, hopefully. And so that's that's the thing here that I think is very important is we have to understand that the dichotomy certainly applies to us in that situation. Anything else on on this section right here before we move on? Well, I you know one other thing I just I wonder if um, salvation or people's perception of salvation has just become very soft, um, like they don't understand like what it means, like they're. You know, who was forgiven or who's going to be more uh, ex, um, thankful for being forgiven the one that was forgiven the small debt or the large debt you know so some of us maybe don't fully understand what that looks like then some of us don't understand what the cost is uh, to be a disciple of, of Christ obviously we're talking about that here but like if we go back a couple of chapters i think uh we look at the narrow gate it's got a sign that says persecution on it you know it's just um it's pretty clear you know this go this narrow narrow way um but there's a cost associated with it so yeah it's a it's a promise but it's a call peter says gird your loins for this persecution is coming to you like man it's it's coming and you need to be ready for it. So, which is crazy, you know, to think uh, the 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 same guy that preaches Matthew or, or preaches the uh, Sermon of the Mount, talking to all this good and loving people, is the most most hated out of everybody. You know, it's crazy. And that and that Christians who should be living that out, and many of them can and rightfully do, can be hated by society. That's just the incredible. This is very odd that, well, it's, that it's is Satan po- working, working obviously behind the scenes. It's poetic in a way, because if the world is the counter of everything that God wants for us post fall, it makes sense that the most righteous, truly righteous among us would be hated and that the most perfect example of moral righteousness, Jesus would be hated to an, a degree so extreme as to cause people to, you know, fall into apoplexy if you even say his name, right? And so it just, we, we go into those different situations where, again, you can tell someone Merry Christmas, but then when you talk about Jesus, like, wait a minute, you know, someone can thank God 
when they're getting their Grammy, but when they start talking about Jesus, like, whoa, this is weird. Yeah. It's that one name that, you know, you, you just can't say it. It brings a whole different thing. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry, gentlemen. Uh, Eric, if you wouldn't mind reading verses 26 through 33, please. So have no fear of them for nothing is covered that will be revealed or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fill him, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. hell. Good grief. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So the first person I thought of for those last couple of verses was Peter. I was like, wait a minute. He denied you before men. But I think it, it, you know, relays the point that Peter didn't stay in his rejection, right? Mm -hmm. If you were to reject God, Jesus outright for forever, then, you know, you will be rejected uh, by the Father in heaven. But I want to go back to verse uh, 28, 28, and do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. I mean, the, the, the worst thing another human can do to you is kill you. Some people would argue the worst thing that they could do to you is sexually assault you or sexually abuse you or rape you, and, you know, because you have to live with the fact that you've been defiled in such an extreme way. So I'm, I'm sensitive to both arguments. But we do have a tremendous amount of fear when it comes to these types of things. But I think back to Columbine. When those two youngins, did you write? Did you write that in your notes? I've got that down right here. Yeah. yeah so absolutely. it's well. Go ahead and hit it. Well, so I, I, I'm assuming you're going to be talking about confessing. Yeah. Before men, because like those that, two those two pieces of garbage put kids I, on their knees. I and, think there's there's a certain level of uh, it's demonic, and and Satan knows the scriptures. And there is this demonic element of putting someone on their knees, putting a gun to their head and saying, do you believe in Jesus? Yeah. And uh, what a story that is. And if for those people who in our audience who are young, maybe don't know what Columbine is, Columbine was, was the first big major school shooting in our nation's history in Columbine, Colorado, yeah? Yep. Um, and these two kids... They gunned down several of their classmates, but the story, the big sto- one of the big stories that came out of that was they they put these two kids on their knees and they said, "Do you believe in Jesus?" And without hesitation, yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Was was to paraphrase how they responded, and they killed him. But that's that's the first thing I thought of was was that story. But there is this demonic aspect of that of, of of the devil just trying to say okay i know this kid's gonna die i know they're a christian maybe i can just get him one more time just get him to just get him to to denounce christ before men and you know then i'll have their eternal soul or they they will be eternally separated from from god like what a powerful story though that they even even then facing death were like yeah yeah, yeah, one of one of the names this this happened in uh, April of 1999 was Rachel Scott. Uh, for anyone that knows, uh, Eric Harrison, Dylan Kleinbold, they they had produced pipe bombs that they were going to blow up in the cafeteria. So even though a lot of young people lost their lives, it was going to be way more. That was that was planned. I think it was 12 students. Uh, I think it says here 12 students and one teacher were killed that day. Mm-hmm. But I also think back to uh, if you guys haven't read the book Tried by Fire by William Bennett, you absolutely have to. It's a accounting of the first thousand years of the Christian church. And when you read about the martyrs from the first, second and third century, especially they they were killed in some of the most horrific ways that you can imagine. They were wow. dipped in boiling water repeatedly until they died. They had a, a hot oil poured over them. They were lit aflame. Um, they were buried alive. There were a couple of stories that they strapped a horse to uh, a rope in one leg and another horse to the other leg, ran the horses in opposite directions and, you know, pulled these people into pieces. Uh, <clears throat> there were people that were strapped to ropes and then strapped to a bull and then the bull would be sent down like these external steps and the person would be killed by hitting all the steps on the way down. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. And we have no accounts 
in either biblical documents, Christian writers, Jewish historians, secular historians, Roman historians, describing any of these people renouncing their faith. Like, that's a pretty extreme thing to think about. I can't remember the story, but the only time where someone that I can think of historically that uh, recanted was uh, in England, I think, during the, the Catholic Protestant kind of wars that were going on there. And I can't remember his name, but he recanted his faith, but he was so convicted that he walked, he walked to the stake because he felt so convicted and was so distraught with himself for denouncing his savior that he willingly said, yeah, you know what? I'm going to (laughs) go, I'm going to go burn because I can't, I can't live with myself. Yeah. In in addition to that William Bennett book, there's one called Jesus Freaks. That's got more modern, yeah, <clears throat> modern accounts. Yep, that's good. Interesting. Yeah. Well, let's hit the next section here. Let's hit verses 34 through 39. We'll take a volunteer. I'll do it. This is probably my favorite part of the. All right, go. Of the, the chapter. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Very popular and well-known section of Matthew. Um, this is a you're with him or you're against him style. I love what John MacArthur said about this particular section. He said, the following Christ presupposes that you are willing to endure hardship. So there's a presupposition here of what you are willing to endure, which again, we've talked about a lot, but I want y'all to hit whatever part of this, because there's a lot you can discuss. The one thing that sticks out for me is, and whoever does not take his cross, that's verse 38. This, again, we have to put ourselves in the context of this time period. That had to have been a shocking thing, a shocking metaphor for the disciples to hear. Because again, they lived in a Roman controlled province, you know, not technically, but literally, and they knew what the Romans would do in order to, you know, control their people. And it was the threat of the worst possible execution and embarrassment uh, of being hung on the cross. And as we learned by uh, reading um, Eugenia Constantino's book, you know, the only dignity that they allowed the Jews that they crucified was they wouldn't crucify them naked because of the laws against. Uh, public nudity or, you know, those types of things. But again, we can't just glaze over that, that when he said that the disciples, their stomachs had to have sunk. Yeah. They knew what the cross was. I wrote, I wrote, they knew what the cross was. And this is the first mention of the cross well before Jesus goes to his death on the cross. It was violent and degrading and following Jesus is not for glitz or glamour, but it, it can be ultimately violent and degrading and you must be committed up to death. And we are insulated from this. Like For in sure. Bodie Bauckham's latest book, The Ever Loving Truth, he, he talks about in there to where it's like, look, we live in perhaps the only country in the world where we're not actually like hunted down and killed for our faith. I, that's not exactly how I said it. I think that's a little bit hyperbolic. But the way he said it was, was perfect, where it's just like, do y'all understand how easy it is to be a Christian in America? Like there is no threat. The worst thing that could happen to you is somebody leaves you a mean comment on your Facebook. Right. And perhaps there are some certain things that are happening in the law now that are not exactly advantageous to Christians, but they're, they're not being executed because you had a copy of the gospel of John under your pillow. Right. Like we, we live in this super easy bubble wrapped version of America. And it's just like the, these people's faith in other countries where, you know, if you're in Nigeria and Boko Haram finds out that you're a Christian, like they might chop your freaking head off. And it's just yeah. like, we don't have to deal with that. But we would, oh, go ahead, Zach. I was just going to say, I, I, don't, I, haven't, I don't know how to articulate this extremely well, but something I've been thinking a lot about is when you take that almost eternal perspective from here moving forward, like think about it from God's perspective. When he said earlier, uh, when Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead, if you think about it from you know, a thousand years from now or 10,000 years from now, this will be so temporal and temporary. And so as he's talking about these harsh things about division and all of that, the people that you're surrounded with that are in Christ are going to be 
you know, in essence, your family for all eternity. And the rest, the rest of the people that are around you that are not, he's laying out very clearly, um, won't be there. You need to think about that with your friends mm-hmm. and your family. It, it gives you some perspective. And, and Christ is very clear about this. And so I think as I, as I read this, um, it hits me that you, you need to take it seriously. And you need to be thinking about those in your life that you can have these types of conversations with. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, um, and we must place the gospel above like personal comfort. I yeah. think is, you know, so in the right in the right situation, whatever that situation is, you know, if it, if if it is to be, then it is to be me. You know, we have to have that kind of attitude um, going into those situations where we can stand in the gap for people. Um, with the hope of them seeing the gospel through, through our faithfulness even. And to put it in even more perspective, uh, we shared this the other day, but the average person lives 28,000 days. So that's 80 years. So each day, just think about that. Uh, the end of the age may not come for a long time, but the end of your age and a very permanent um, home after that is going to come soon. Uh, and it's going to be the same for those around you. Uh, and then eventually you're talking about, man, we really want people to, to get what they deserve. I think when we get to heaven, I don't know, but we're told that every tear is going to be wiped and there's going to be joy. I don't know if we're even going to comprehend what happened to those people. I have no idea. I, I, I kind of think that we, it's not going to, we're not going to be thinking much about that. I don't, I mm-hmm. think you're right there. I think we're, we're standing in the presence of God, seeing his holiness. Um, we can get a glimpse of what that might be like. I mean, Moses caught a glimpse of God's backside when it talks about he sees God's glory, like the, the verbiage used there is he sees his backside and then the people couldn't even look at him. So the reflection of God's backside was so blinding that the people that he went down to see from the mountain couldn't even look upon his face without shuddering in fear. So I, to your point, I think we're not going to be thinking about a lot of things outside of being in the presence of God. But to your point about Americans not, we're kind of we're kind of lulled our lulled into sleep of like not being persecuted. Um, I always think back to this uh, this quote Martin Niemöller, Lutheran Lutheran pastor uh, during the the nineteen thirties, and I think we'd be wise to not just say ah it's easy I don't it's good I'm not persecuted it's cool. We should still speak to the things that the the gospel speaks to and speak towards injustices. And this quote this quote can be haunting and very convicting all at the same time. First, they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. And he, man. It's brutal. It's, yeah, it's a brutal quote because, I mean, you look at Bonhoeffer's life. He, he obviously thought, I'm going to speak truth. And I'm going, even, even if it causes me death and I'll obviously it ultimately did, but what's well, because we get to choose the hill we die on. Yeah. And that's one thing I've said for forever is Christians and conservatives have followed the 11th commandment. Thou shalt be nice. And we never find a hill that is worth dying on. And you can twist yourself up into theological pretzels, trying to avoid entering the culture war. Right. And people are like, oh, Christians should take the Benedict option and not just defile themselves by being in the culture war. And I'm like, by culture war, do you mean the fact that little girls are having their breasts cut off and little boys are having their penises cut off or they're, you know, taking these, uh, you know, these hormones that that can't be reversed. They're like, being murdered in the womb. Right. Like, yeah. w- help me see the middle ground on this. Yeah. Right. When people are like, oh, we're going to advocate from the the less loud middle. Really? Where exactly is that? Can you help me find the, the, the middle ground of whether or not we slaughter innocent babies in the womb? Can you help me find the yeah. middle ground? And so again, we, it, it makes us feel good, but actually it's cowardly yeah. because it's like, I don't want to enter into these discussions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put those discussions into a category where we just can't touch that. It's too hot, but it's like, sorry, we don't get that option right now. That's not licensed to be a jerk. Sure. That's not licensed to go into every situation looking to piss people off. But look, we're already guaranteed that people are going to hate us. And so if we say something like, uh, it's actually not your body, so it's not your choice, it's inside of your body, people are going to hate you for saying that. You say it all the more, 
right? That That's the standard. Two things come to mind there. I heard a guy once express culture as if you're a fish swimming through the water, you don't know exactly what you're swimming through, but that's literally the culture. Mm. Um, so you're in it regardless of if you're trying to stay, you can't stay out of it. The other thing is you can never not communicate. So even with your silence, you're even with your silence. Right. So you yeah. are participating in the culture regardless. You might as well do it with some intentionality. Go back to, I know, uh, Matt, you borrowed uh, the letter to the American Church of American Metaxas, and you're reading through it right now. Have you gotten to the section about the churches in Germany yet? Mm. Uh, the 12,000? Yeah, I so think, I forget yeah, the I, exact I, numbers, I but... I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. Yeah, so Eric Metaxas, I, I think the number was around 1,200. I can't remember the exact number, but there is a certain number of Christian pastors in Germany that if they could go back in time, and if those people had, it, had stood up against the rise of the Nazi party and Hitler and the brown shirts and, and all that, if they just should, stood up and said no, as opposed to just acquiescing or to silently taking it or whatever, these people weren't, you know, putting up swastikas inside their churches necessarily. They were just allowing, you know, yeah, go ahead and play through. Hey, it was Romans, kind of their Romans attitude. 13, like, yeah. hey, we, Romans 13, yeah. like, yeah, y'all, y'all, we'll, we will bow to you as our magistrates. If a small number had actually flipped and been against them, there's no rise of the Third Reich. There is no Holocaust. There is no World War II. We're talking about tens of millions of people would not have died. Now, you could say, well, if that didn't happen, then it would have happened here with this group and that group, maybe, right? But we would need a parallel universe by which to, to differentiate and, and find that. That's the, the big issue that I pe- people don't understand is they're like, I'm just going to let people push on me. It's no big deal. We'll let somebody else fight that fight. You have no idea because, you know, you made the point earlier, Zach, you know, our 80 years is just a blip on the radar. The 20th century, though, that is until history ends, that is a hit, that is a time period that we will be able to look back on and say at no point in history did more people die because of atheistic regimes than in the 20th century in the world. And so that's not just a blip. And it was because a bunch of individuals decided this isn't worth it. Like, this isn't the hill to die on. Uh, I don't want to seem unwinsome. Like, I don't want to seem like any of those types of things. Like, I'm just going to go along to get along. I want to be known for what I'm for, not what I'm against. And then look what happened, right? It, it comes out to a murderous end. Yeah, that's a tough, that's a difficult place because I think all things happen to God's glory and history bends to God's will. And, and what was meant for evil, to, to quote Joseph from Genesis, God meant for good. And I mean, but I think there's a lot of truth to that. And we, I think we live in a time where we can act that out and act that faith out. There's, I mean, there's Esther again. I, I think Esther is a great example. I think she saved thousands of, of, of Jewish people from death because she was obedient to calling. And who knows, maybe if she said no, a bunch of them would have died. It would have been to God's glory for sure. But she acted in her time that God had called and ordained for her to do. And are we being obedient to that now? Just as the pastors in Germany were being disobedient. There's a, you know, we're called to have, have faith and have, and have some inner peace and trust and that sort of thing. And that's absolutely the case. The other thing I think about is I heard a quote the other day and it's by Trudeau, which is not my favorite source Pierre or Justin, (laughs) but it's true. He made it and it's not exactly right, but he said things have never, um, moved as fast as they are today and they'll never be this slow again. So if you think about like the 20th century, like you talked about and how horrific many things were and there were good things too, but they happened at a little slower pace today. It's even more imperative that we have to be plugged in and paying attention and intentional trusting but engaged because things are happening at a very rapid clip. What I remind people of all the time is five years ago. So we'll say this 10 years ago, gay marriage across the entire United States seemed crazy. I think Obergfeld was 2015. So less than 10 years ago, five years ago, the idea that we would be, there would be people advocating for children to be put on uh, puberty blockers and have their genitalia altered or cut off or whatever. But I mean, what? That's crazy. And I remember saying several years ago, I started talking to people. I was like, guys, pedophilia is next. They will normalize pedophilia. 
Because again, if you are 10 years old and you can choose your gender, why can you not choose your sexual partner? If I can identify as something that I am biologically not, why can I not identify by a different biological clock? As a 37-year-old man, why can't I identify as a 13-year-old so that I can enter into a sexual relationship with a 13-year-old? Again, you have to extrapolate out the worldview to its logical end. And people are like, oh, that's crazy, Kyle. Now, I know you say some crazy stuff on your show, but dude, come on. It's like, what else do you need to see? You think this train stops? Isn't that being wise as serpents? You would so, think you know, so. Like that's, that, that's a call to understand how the world works and understand how Satan does things and logically take out that argument to its conclusion. And like you're, like you're saying there, like if, people can, if, if kids can consent to changing their gender, let's, let's flush that out fully. Like let's think about this critically and put some categories on things and don't be dumb. RC Sproul says you don't have to lose your intellect to be a Christian, but you do have to use your, you do have to lose your pride. So we can be smart and we can be intellectual and we can understand what these things, logical conclusions end at. And I think to your point, it's, we have to understand where that goes. Be wise as serpents. And part of it is that Christians would much rather cover their eyes and plug their ears and not have to deal with this. And this is proven by the fact that I give these abortion talks and it makes people really uncomfortable. And it's like, why? I'm equipping you with the tools that you need in this battle, with the weapons that you need for this fight. I'm not equipping you with, here's the one stat you can throw in that pro-abortion person's face to dunk on the libs. That's not what I'm doing. I want you to, in a loving way, push back against their hateful, murderous ideology, right? So, so that you're not having to peel yourself off of them after you've bludgeoned them into the ground. I'm giving you a different option where you can use your words to potentially win them over to the moral position. But Christians are not prepared for the fight. They don't have an apologia or apologia for their faith, much less being able to push back against specific ideologies. So if you're a Christian and you're not comfortable engaging in a discussion about abortion, or how are you going to have a discussion about transgenderism? And if you're not comfortable with that, how are you going to have a discussion about pedophilia or uh, polyamory or any of those types of things? Like you're just not ready. You're not equipped. Yeah. And, and you're saying, you know, things are moving faster and they'll never move slower. Well, they're also coming earlier, you know? So when we think about our family and we think about our kids, like, I don't know how old you were whenever you got the birds and the bees talk, if you even got it, you know, um, mine happened to come through my junior high class, you know, science teacher was introducing me to that. So I was at least 12, I guess, maybe 13. But, um, but now like your, your first exposure to pornography for most boys is around the age of eight. Right. Right. And, and if a kid doesn't know, I mean, my seven-year-old knows more, at least as many terms as I know about all the cultural things that we've got going on. And so she may have questions about them and not fully understand, but they're out there, Mm -hmm. you know, and I can't even open up Twitter X, whatever you want to call it, without immediately seeing things that, you know, push, push my button basically. Cause they're just right in my face. And that's you know? hard. I, I had to, so for me specifically, it was fifth grade. I remember, I remember the conversations in the schoolyard, but because of all of our friend groups that have children that are our age, or maybe kids that have just come from children that are our age, they warned us. So then you have to think, well, I guess I need to have this discussion now in first grade or second grade. Right. <laughs> but it, and it doesn't end, and it doesn't end there. That's just a beginning. That's just a start, right? So then just any opportunity, I mean, see, these are all teachable moments. So anytime a, a commercial come on, comes on or mm-hmm. there's a, a new Disney movie that has a gay and lesbian, whatever, uh, you know, now you have opportunities. So it becomes this ongoing thing. So just for anybody that's listening, it's not a one-time thing, not a one-time conversation, but it's, a, it's many small conversations you have, just an ongoing open dialogue about this sort of thing with your kids because they're going to get exposed to it and they're going to get exposed to it repeatedly. And we don't need them being subject. Well, they're going to be subject to, but we don't need them to, um, Oh, I don't know what the word is, but you know, when someone says it enough times, you know, and with authority that it somehow is kind of perceived as being right, you know, we don't need them to get dumbed down and start believing this crap. So. And if you don't do it, the culture is fine to do it oh, for absolutely. you. Absolutely. Right. They, kids, and the culture is not going to nudge yeah. you in a certain direction. It's going to force you down a certain direction. Your kids will be catechized. You get to choose by whom. Steve Lawson says we are to be a ship in the ocean, which is the world, but not let any water in. And I, I we're called to pull people out, call, pull them out, dry them off. Now you're in the boat. 
but yeah. The world, the world is coming for us. You know, one, one of the, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, but one of the things that <clears throat> um, I would say to any parent is, you know, I, I had the, the privilege of being discipled and mentored by a, by a person that had, um, has a desire to do that and that had been discipled and whatnot. <clears throat> but your discipleship starts at home. You know, it should be father and mother discipling their kids. Um, and there's nothing wrong with me getting that extra mentorship um, for later on, but we can't push off that sort of thing to our churches, to our youth pastors, to someone that may or may not exist in the future that will um, pour into your child's life. You need to be doing it. And it is a difficult job. And, you know, it talks about the workers are few. We don't need to be families that aren't working hard at catechizing our kids. So, 80% of the life questions in our house come like, Five minutes before you're supposed to be asleep. Yeah. So make sure you're engaged the whole day. <laughs> right. All the way to the end. I had a, a former Sunday school teacher tell me that bedtime, bedtime is the greatest thing that you can have as a parent because it, it really is an invitation to the window of your child's soul. Because that's, like you said, that's when that stuff comes up because, you know, you're a captive audience. You're sitting there. The day's over. And so, like, yes, we should be, we should be prepared and ready to to speak to that yeah and the other even just car rides in the you know with, with yep. your son he doesn't you don't have to be face to face looking each other eye to eye to have yeah. a conversation just right. go go to lowe's together yeah. in, a, in the car you're side by side or he's in the back seat or whatever and you're just you can have a conversation just like that and that's one thing that i've had to remind myself because as i've said before my schedule is so jam-packed and we don't have a lot of extra options locally here for child care and so my wife and i don't get very much time to do the things that we need to do and so I, I try to squeeze every last second out of my day, wake up early, get my lift in or my jujitsu in or my run in or whatever. And then I just, I'm just squeezing things into every inch of every day. And so it's like, you know, I'm not just doing the dishes. I'm doing the dishes while listening to a podcast. I'm not just doing these. I'm trying to like stack things up. And so there have been a lot of times where I've rushed bedtime with, with James and it's like, all right, quick book, let's read it. All right, quick prayer. All right, see you later, man. Don't get out of your bed. Like, and then, you know, cause I got to go get work done. Right. Cause it's only another hour or two before I need to go to sleep. And then it all starts over again. Same thing in the car, as you mentioned, Eric, there have been times where it's like, okay, kids in the car, but podcasts are going, got to, got to listen to these podcasts, got to get all this information, got to keep going. And then it's just like, wait a minute, pause, turn it down. James, you know, he's three. So he's basically a, an ape at this point. And so, but I at least try to have a conversation with him where I'm just like, Hey man, you know, what was your favorite part of your day? I don't know. Hey, you know, uh, you know, how did, what's your teacher's name? I'll just kind of quiz him. Dad, I'm a dinosaur. And so these aren't like the most enthralling conversations for an adult that wants to have, you know, serious, meaningful uh, concepts, but it's like you're open, you're keeping a door of communication open with your kid. And so for you, dad, Zach, I know you're really good about this, like taking that time before bed to have those conversations. It's a daily deposit into the, the, you know, the bank account of the kid to say, Hey, look, like I'm, I'm here for you. These lines of communication are open. And so when it's not just normal every day, Hey, what was your favorite part of your day? But it's, Hey dad, I'm really struggling. They know that they can come to you. So, um, we got to get to the end here, but we have a couple of more verses. So Eric, if you wouldn't mind closing us out with, uh, verses 40, 41 and 42. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly, I say to you, he will be by no means lose his reward. So this gets into the discussion of rewards, I think, going to what you were talking a little bit about uh, earlier, Zach, and not necessarily like the rewards that will be stored up for us in heaven, but it's just basically talking about, you know, right treatment of p a particular people in a particular group. So y'all have any thoughts on those, those last few verses of Matthew 10? Well, I think um, we're talking about Christ's kingship and we are sealed by the spirit. Um, and there's this, there's this, great picture of messengers of the king who carry the king's messages sealed by his, um, or that, that carry his seal. They are representative of him. They, they are, they are in, in lack of a better term, they are him. They, they proclaim his message. They carry his authority. And so, I mean, I think he's talking about if you receive these people, you are receiving me. If you reject them, you are, you are rejecting me because I am, I am giving them the authority of the king. You should treat them as such. 
That's what I got out of it anyway. Did matches slam at home here at the end? No one has any other thoughts? Uh, it's pretty good. Eric, Zach? I just, you know, I, I think the only thing, I, I just think about opportunities for hospitality and bringing people in um, to your home is, I think it's very important. Um, and so just being able to to do that for folks is, is, is great, you know, and as far as rewards go, I mean, we kids and I have had discussions about rewards and um, interesting, you know, it's like, it's, I guess the Bible says that we, we receive rewards in heaven. Um, I don't, I don't, you guys may have different thoughts on that, but I feel like the rewards we, we receive are like crowns that then we lay down at the feet of Jesus, if I remember. And so it's almost like we give up what we have, you know, but, um, but, um, and so I never want to get in the, mode of somehow like I'm working for a reward. I'm just working to glorify God and his kingdom. Um, and that's the most important thing. So Zach, anything else before we leave it? Uh, no, this just says, you know, we can be a blessing to others and not everyone will reject our witness. Some will welcome us and receive a blessing. After all, we are the ambassadors of the King. Our King will make sure we are rewarded for what we do. When people receive us, they welcome the King for we are his representatives. Read 2 Samuel 10 for an example of what happens when Mm. people mistreat the envoys of the king. Mm. So I think it's just a little bit of a, um, it's important to think, you know, be engaged, see how you can help. And it also says that we should be the envoy going out, you know. um, Yeah. And just because your extension of grace or hospitality has been rejected doesn't mean you shouldn't have offered it from from the get-go. So that's something to keep in mind as well. But guys, there's more to be said, but we're going to leave it there in terms of our discussion of Matthew 10. Come back here next week where we are going to dig into Matthew 11. So make sure you're read through Matthew 11 so that you can be prepared for that discussion. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost. At Undaunted Life, our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So just a reminder, the forging table starts starter set by Crossway. All the instructions are here in the show notes for you to get that amazing set of five books so that you can start your own forging table. And then also just wanted to remind you that we are a donation-based ministry. So if you want to be able to help us, equip us so that we can equip men like you around the globe to be able to push back darkness, hop on board and become a monthly donor. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. If you want me to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. Follow us on Instagram and like us on Facebook and check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And also we want to thank the band Holy Name for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Perpetual. Perpetua, which is off their self-titled debut album on Face Down Records. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah.